It is being bold. It is being brilliant. It's being non-apologetic about what we're doing. You know, we had to leverage those abilities and just to come to the table and uh, execute like never before. Bring in capable people, coach them, uh, make sure they're connected to the outcome uh, and let them run. As a leader and with your team, have to have the will to win. Connecting more with our humanity and, um, you know, pausing for a moment to be the human beings that we are. And but with humility, you know that you can leverage that, that skill set that people have and let them be their best. This will be a time of innovation. Hi, and welcome to Courageous Leadership in Times of Global Crisis and Uncertainty, an HMG live virtual briefing covering what matters most to drive a winning agenda and make the future a better place. A warm welcome to today's host, lead principal and CEO of HMG Strategy, Hunter Muller. Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Washington DC CIO, CISO, sorry, virtual summit. I'm Hunter Muller, lead principal, principal of HMG Strategy. My team and I are delighted to be here reimagining the business and the future of the workplace. What you need to know now. Look, we've been on quite a journey since uh, the pandemic hit. Um, hopefully you've been dialed into some of our past programs. Uh, real excited about today's summit. I think uh, we have a world-class uh, agenda and some world-class speakers here to present their points of view and uh, help you through uh, these challenging times. You know, please look to our website at hmgstrategy.com uh, and specifically the events, HMG Live tab. Click down, uh, we probably had about 15 different summits in the past uh, 60 days, and we're planning another 30 over the next 60 days. So please dial in and spread the word to your peers, uh, your colleagues, and your friends. And again, thanks for zooming in today. Uh, this is HMG Live, we're ready to go. So real excited to in, uh, introduce our first guest of the day, Boyd Boyden Rohner, Associate Director for Vulnerability of Management of CISA. Boyden, welcome to the program. Great to see you. Good morning, Hunter. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here at HMG Live. Oh, it's exciting. Hey, listen, let's tell us a little bit about CISA uh, and what CISA is all about and CISA's mission. Absolutely. Uh, the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA, is the newest part of the Department of Homeland Security. We are the nation's risk advisor. So uh, in other words, that means we are in the position of trying to find ways to secure today and defend tomorrow, both in uh, cyber and um, also in physical infrastructure. Uh, my portfolio is on the vulnerability management side for cybersecurity. Uh, so uh, it's going to be great to talk with you all today. So what are you noticing new and different uh, post COVID-19 uh, in terms of uh, activity? Well, absolutely. Well, uh, I think it's very prescient that you've titled your conference today, you know, the future of, of business. Uh, there have never been more people working remotely, working from home, uh, using the internet um, and um, using, um, you know, using web browsing. So um, we are thinking of ways to make that more secure. Um, putting out different guidance, trying to offer new services. Uh, so that's really the, the focus uh, for us. And secondly, uh, you know, we're really focused on um, helping secure the response to COVID, the nation's response, and um, helping support all the critical infrastructure owners and operators who are, um, you know, on the front lines of developing a vaccine and providing um, PPE to the American citizens. It's a real broad mandate. Um, can we di dig in a little bit further? What are your top three things that uh, are on your mind right now? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we have a very a big mandate, um, but somebody's got to do it. Uh, so um, I'd say uh, the top top thing for me is you know get, making sure we're getting the word out about what CISA is and how it can be helpful to uh, critical infrastructure owners and operators, and particularly CISOs. Um, specifically um, making sure that we're getting that community um, visiting the CISA webpage and signing up for alerts and the publications that we're updating you know, almost daily. Um, those publications and best practices and guidance that we're putting out is based off of our unique vantage point, which uh, enables us, you know, since we're with the federal government and we have 
access to classified information, access to international partners. Uh, you know, we look across all 16 critical infrastructure sectors. We work hand in glove with all of the um, federal and state and local um, government IT providers. That unique vantage point enables us to really publish guidance that can be helpful for your sector or your line of business. Um, you know, one of the um, kind of most important products we've put out there was, you know, identifying who are actually es essential workers. That was a product that got a lot of attention that we, we put out there. So this is really wearing our hat as the nation's risk advisor. So really encourage folks to go to our website, just sign up for those, um, sign up for those alerts so that you'll get notified when something um, new is published. Uh, you know, secondly, uh, what's on my mind is um, getting more people signed up for our free services. So um, that could be um, our uh, network vulnerability scanning that we offer for free. It's very easy to enroll. And um, you know, if you already are paying for a service like that, we can um, be sort of a checksum for the service you're already paying for. And you're doing your part of being a good Samaritan and enabling us to have the data so we can uh, really anonymize those results and, and talk about the trends we're seeing. Um, so those are kind of the two biggest things um, that we're doing on a national scale. Um, and then thirdly, you know, um, putting out specific guidance that helps you know, individuals um, be safer and organizations be safer in the telework environment. Excellent. Wow. Appreciate your service and uh, your engagement. That's awesome. So what are some of the things uh, that members of this audience can do to help CISA uh, to work in securing critical infrastructure? Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I, I would ask them to do is to, um, you know, to take a look at their, um, their, their, uh, um, their website practices, you know, are they, um, you know, uh, prioritizing just, you know, one or two web browsers and, and um, hardening or writing configuration guidelines around those, you know, that's one of the main ways that um, uh, uh, users are are working through these days. So making sure that you know you really limit the number of web browsers you have as much as possible. Um, you know, implying um, you know web content filtering or making sure that you're reducing um, malvertising. Um, and then thirdly, sort of on the cutting edge, uh, the cutting edge, um, thinking about employing you know isolation architecture. That's one of the areas that we're piloting right now with with DISA. So those are three sort of uh, easy things to do. Isolation. Or, you know, Isolation yeah. architecture is, is a really big uh, ticket item, uh, and people are getting a lot of lift on that. Uh, it came up in a recent summit just this week. A little bit more on that. Yeah, so I, I shouldn't have implied that was an easy thing to do necessarily. We're really in the early stage of looking at the, the return on investment for that, but we're really intrigued, and I would just encourage um, the audience to research that more. I'm kind of curious um, if there's a poll to find out if anybody is actually employing that kind of technology. Um, you know, we're working with DISA right now to get some specific data to, to see if that's a, a worth, worthwhile uh, uh, service or, or um, you know, um, course of action to recommend broadly. Um, so that's where we are, are right now with that. Excellent. So how did you, how did you land uh, in this role? I mean, a little bit more about your, the context of your background and your career. Oh, my pleasure. Well, uh, you know, I started my professional life as a, as a naval officer. So I was a, 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 I was a, a surface warfare officer in the Navy and uh, found my way to Homeland Security after I got off of active duty, uh, wound up in the uh, Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity Operations Center. So the, the, the SOC for DHS, uh, which is really where I cut my teeth on cybersecurity and found my passion at combining sort of organizational development uh, practices with uh, you know, managing a technical workforce. And uh, from there, I found my way to, to CISA. Oh, interesting. Uh, and how long have you been with CISA? This uh, since 2017. So I was with it when it was, uh, when, when it was the precursor to um, what we're named today. I was with it when it was the National Programs and Protection Directorate. Uh, really glad that Congress uh, passed the Cyber Security Information Security um, Agency Act to make us, uh, you know, an operational part of Homeland Security. So we're on par with, you know, Coast Guard and Secret Service and Customs and Border Protection. So really recognizing that, you know, cyber is not just about policy, it's about operations, it's about response, it's about prevention. And, uh, and that's how I made my way here and specifically into the prevention, prevention mission. 
when you talk about how big of an issue that we have here, Boyden, on a national, global level, how do you articulate that to our, uh, to our audience, uh, basically mostly enterprise CISOs, uh, the scale and the scope and uh, how, how seriously the current administration uh, and uh, DHS and the CISOs is taking this, uh, the current status? Yeah, it's a really great question. Well, I think, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, we've been getting, uh, you know, more interest in our services and, you know, more funding from Congress and more inquiries from the American people. So I think everyone recognizes that, uh, you know, more devices and more activity and more work is being done across the internet every day. I mean, this pandemic has really just put that into the forefront of everyone's mind. People who've never had to work from home before are trying to figure that out. Um, and, you know, there's no, I mean, our, you know, our top, um, our top priorities this year um, are, uh, you know, securing the COVID response and thinking really creatively about um, the owners and operators that are, are pivotal to that. So we're making new connections, we're rethinking what services we can offer, we're partnering with the interagency. Um, and, you know, luckily for us, we have a lot of practice at doing this well. We um, learned a lot after the 2016 elections and um, did, a, I think, a really great job of working with the interagency and state and local governments to secure the uh, midterms in 2018. So um, the general election was really at the forefront of our mind this year, um, and it's still right there at the top, along with um, making sure that we're doing what we can to help um, owners and operators with the COVID um, pandemic response. You know, this at the risk of being kind of edgy here, it's, it's such a new environment and such a new space to talk about publicly in a public forum. But uh, I've been tracking this now for 10 or 12 years with my uh, CIOs and CISOs, and this uh, nation state uh, aggressions and nation state attacks essentially, you might even call it, we've been at war, it's cyber, some kind of cyber war. My words, not yours. Be interested to flip it to you in terms of the lexicon that you choose and how you roll up your the findings of your reports about what's really happening out there. It, it's pretty scary. Yeah, um, you know, I, I leave the de declarations of war to you know Congress. However, um, you know, we have been really clear and on record and via our products and in partnership with the FBI, talking about the consistent and person persistent threat to. Um, you know, U.S. critical infrastructure. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of nation state actors continuing their intent as they've been doing for years on um, trying to get a hold of our intellectual property, um, trying to, you know, sow misinformation and disinformation. So that's not really a new, uh, a new thing. They just have, in this case, a new motivation or a new, uh, a new uh, pitch, so to speak, in terms of um, the increase in COVID-themed spear phishing and phishing campaigns. Um, so, uh, so, you know, same motivations or same um, type of um, activity, just, uh, you know, new, new context. It's fascinating, right? Uh, and great answer. Thank you for that. And, and thank you for your service. Closing question, what keeps you up at night? What is what is it that you wake up and go, wow, I really need to be focusing on this now in my yeah. room? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, you know, so much of my history, my career was spent doing incident response. And now that I'm in a prevention mission, I am really focused on, you know, what is the equivalent of, you know, soap and water or what is the equivalent of like prevention or, or uh, what is the equivalent of the root cause problem that we can solve to make the uh, cybersecurity ecosphere more secure? You know, how can we prevent vulnerabilities before they enter the ecosphere, as opposed to just managing them once they're there? So I'm really trying to look at, my team and I are really trying to look at, you know, what are the root causes for the problems that manifest downstream? So that's really, uh, that's really where I'm spending uh, my, my, uh, my extra brain power trying to figure that out. Super. How can folks connect to you and again in your organization and how can we help in a public private uh, partnership? Awesome. Thank you. Yes, I, I would really encourage folks to, you know, go to CISA.gov like right now if you can um, sign up for the alerts. I do. I, I love to get them. It keeps me um, on, on point with what we're publishing. We got we have new guidance out all the time. We're always publishing about new vulnerabilities, you know, amplifying, uh, amplifying important things when they come out. Um, and then again, also, you know, sign up for our services. They're free. 
We have a lot of tools that you can use yourselves that are posted on GitHub, so they're completely open source and transparent. Um, if you go to the CISA website and you click the services button, it'll take you to a whole, whole charter there. That really is, um, you get a lot of benefit personally as an organization, but also you're doing your part to help your country because we get the data. We're always anonymous in how we publish trends, but it really is a great information exchange. And then thirdly, you know, if you happen to be a part of an organization that uh, has an incident, you know, please make sure that you're calling, you know, calling CISA or calling someone in the federal government if you're closer uh, allies, the FBI, you know, a call to one is a call to all of us when you have an incident because we want to get that information out there um, uh, to the to the peers, your peers, to make sure they can protect themselves as best as possible. Hey, Boyden, thanks so much for coming on the program today. One final question. Are you re looking to build out advisory boards or panels so to, to broker the public-private partnership? And if so, can people again reach to you directly? Uh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, one major part of our organization is the National Risk Management Center. So, uh, so they are where private industry and the government is coming together to identify national critical functions. So that's a great uh, place to look up. Um, again, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at creating boards all the time. Um, we, we've had the idea of creating a hacker advisory board, for example. Um, so uh, go to the CISA website and you can find more information there or, you know, share my contact through your, uh, your community. We'll be happy to talk more. Boy, it is great to be with you here today. Thanks for coming on the program. Appreciate your service. It's a great job. I really would like to work with you long term, building that public-private partnership. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye now. Next up, John Yannanelli. John's a great friend and a supporter of the HMG Network for some probably 10 years. John, welcome to the program. Hunter, thanks for having me this morning. John's a fascinating individual. Uh, been uh, FBI uh, top executive for over 20 years. What, 30? 25? A uh, little over 20 with the FBI, but some prior law enforcement before then as well. Yeah, and uh, a Fox News uh, a business analyst, right, on cyber? Uh, I'm a contributor for cyber and other law enforcement issues for the Fox News channel. And you have now an incredibly successful consulting group, and you have some cool clients, right? Uh, things are good. So, and uh, when the world is bad, things are even better for those of us in the cyber business. So, John, what are you seeing out there now? Well... You know, everything's changed, Hunter. I, think about it. The, the way we do business today, you know, even how we interact with our families, how we travel, if we're traveling at all, uh, how we're getting medical care, how we're spending our leisure time, all of that has become digital, essentially, and we're now online. And companies are recognizing this. A lot of them scrambled at the beginning of the COVID to figure out how are they going to continue to do work. And we're finding that, hey, it works pretty well. All these companies that prior to COVID thought, I don't want my employees working from home. It's too difficult. Uh, I need them where I can see them. They're suddenly realizing, wait a minute, business works pretty well remotely. And in many respects, the cost savings from the infrastructure of not having them all in one place can be used in other areas. Now, what they need to worry about is the cyber threats because those threats have increased exponentially now that we have every employee working out of their house. That's true, right? And what are the typical uh, weaknesses in the, uh, in the architecture, John? Where do, where do those uh, breaches usually come in uh, in those, those attacks? So no one working from home, for the most part, is thinking about cybersecurity. Most employees left their jobs, went home, and thought about how am I gonna get my next paycheck? I don't wanna go on unemployment. I wanna be able to continue to do my job. So everything was about workarounds. How can I get on the network? Uh, I'm using the same Wi-Fi and computer that my kids are using to play Fortnite and things like that. That's where all the dangers come in. And we need to really stress the importance of network security for employees working from home because all I need now is not to breach the company. If I can breach that one employee working in Steubenville, it's gonna get me into the network. That's where I can load the ransomware, uh, the business email compromise, all those threats that existed before COVID are even more so now. 
Interesting. Uh, so you work with clients across North America, right? Uh, in, in many industries. Uh, inter any interesting uh, stories of late? Yes, what I've seen is a lot of clients have been affected because of trying to stay on top of COVID. The cyber criminals out there worldwide have figured this out. And like always tacking on to some major disaster, now they're doing a lot of impersonation. We're seeing emails coming out, updates from the World Health Organization that contain malware and a link that will download various malware onto computers. We're seeing the same things from uh, the CDC, but we've seen some great uh, types of attempts where they'll infiltrate the company so through a typical business email compromise, but they'll purport to be from the company, here's the latest health news to keep our employees safe. And meanwhile, it's just downloading malware. So not only are they getting the, into all the company's networks, but now they have the advantage of getting into the personal computers of all these employees, stealing bank information, PII, et cetera. It's a dangerous time and people need to take the time to keep themselves safe. Johnny, your point of view, what kind of a multiple by move, move, moving this distributed work from home environment uh, are we now exposed both individually and the company's uh, enterprise? Well, certainly the exposure is more, but you know what, this is a great opportunity uh, for business. We're going through a revolution right now and uh, literally it's industrialization 4.0. We are taking things digital on such a fast scale. You know, previously companies were starting to digitize. Uh, many were being progressive about it. Now everybody's been forced to do it. I was dealing with car dealerships yesterday that have decided they want to see how much operations they can now do remotely from this time forward in selling cars. You'll meet with your salesperson online. You'll take a look around the showroom. You'll pick out what you want. And when you finally arrive at the dealership, your car will be waiting for you or they'll just deliver it to you. So it changes dramatically how much you can do. You don't have to worry about somebody walking into your business anymore. Now you can walk into their home thanks to COVID. Interesting times, right? Uh, you know, same question to you though, that I gave to Boyden. What is it that uh, keeps you up at night? What are you thinking about right now? Uh, what keeps me up at night is the fact that when you look at the nation states that are taking advantage of this, uh, China, who, you know, without getting into the politics, at least we know systematically that's where this all uh, started from. China has been putting massive efforts into hacking into U.S. industry as a result of COVID, taking advantage of the very work from home employees that I've spoken of. Uh, we've gotten so busy with worried about COVID, rightfully so, we've taken our eye off the ball and who's talking about Iran anymore? Iran certainly hasn't forgotten about us and they're actively trying to hack into all of our infrastructures nationwide and not just the things like the electrical grid or hospitals, but if they can affect private business and hurt us, then that gives them the advantage of dr dragging down the economy elevating themselves. Nation state threats are very real and businesses tend to forget that because they think, who wants to hack me? If you're making money, if you have employees, if you're part of our economy, they are looking at you and want to hurt you. Yeah, how big of a uh, uh, force is that? Uh, big of a, how big of a quantification is that the nation states, John? I've heard it's in the billions. It's massive. When you think of China, they have two billion people, even if it was a fraction of that that's working in cyber. And it's not just individuals, it's the military, it's operations that are set up. They have divisions of cyber hackers, just the same way we have divisions of soldiers. They are prepared to go to war. And for us, it's a cyber war that they're already fighting. Great, thanks, John. Any final parting co comments? All the protections we know that we should be taking beforehand, we need to be imparting to our employees. Make sure they understand how serious this is in keeping safe. The average employee doesn't go home thinking about cyber. They're not like you and I that lie in bed and think about the next big hack that might be coming. 
we have to make sure we're training our people. It's better to get in front of the problem than try to fix the problem afterwards. Excellent, John. Great to see you. Thanks so much for making today's summit. Um, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Good to be here. Great. Thanks. Next up, Ed Amoroso. Ed's uh, kind of an industry legend, I like to say, a living legend, uh, and a very young one at that. Uh, and Ed's uh, probably in this whole space 40 years, one of the iconic uh, executives originally, uh, first maybe CISO ever at AT&T. Ed, welcome. Hi, Hunter. How are you doing? Great. Good to see you. Hey, Ed, what's on your mind in the current environment? Uh, what are you seeing around the globe and uh, with your clients? Well, quite a bit of change, right? Um, an acceleration of changes that we all predicted. Um, a lot of good points made, um, you know, by Boyden and and, uh, and John, I thought. the, um, For example, uh, I don't think there's anybody listening to this uh, webinar who wouldn't expect that the way the wind's blowing, it's blowing more virtual and more remote. I mean, it's, uh, supporting remote access is not something new. Um, and doing virtual telework is not something new. So we all, we all saw it growing, but, but this event, you know, forced everyone to go from, you know, whatever percentage to everyone all day long, every day, you know, working remotely. And it's, it's caused change, like remote access gateways have had to be adjusted. Policies have had to be adjusted business processes have had to be adjusted to account, uh, accommodate um, a, a new work arrangement. So again, it's not that it's new, it's that it's changing, it's changing quickly. And my observation, have been, haven't been doing this so darn long, is that when you do the root cause on cybersecurity incidents, the kinds of things that uh, Boyden would be off uh, helping, uh, you know, helping uh, businesses and individuals deal with, when you go look and you see what, what was the problem, what caused it, setting aside obviously that there's some adversary, but what did they exploit? I would say nine times out of 10, they exploited something that was changed, either sloppily or, or too quickly or without a good understanding of what the side effects or implications of that change might be. So when you, when you, when you put in place, for example, um, procedures for helping people gain access to the network, to um, you know, the enterprise network if it still exists, um, you might have workarounds for um, emergencies that you, you wouldn't have had before. You know, now you've got everybody calling in and it's always I need to be on in 30 seconds and the help desk just might become a little bit more lax. And then they get attacked and you go back and look and you say, why did we get attacked? And it was that change, it was that workaround that you did because you were forced to do it quickly, you didn't think it through, it seemed like the right thing to do at the, uh, at the time. And that's what we're, we're living through right now. So if you, if you fast forward the movie about three or four months and we're sitting out, you know, kind of into, um, you know, time our kids are all going back to school you know, or maybe October, November, when we, in that time frame, I guarantee you we'll be seeing a, a evidence that there were significant break-ins and significant cybersecurity incidents that are going on right now as we're speaking and we don't notice them. But then when we look back, we'll realize Somebody today, somebody end of May, early June, made some change, did something. It left the vulnerability wide open. It got exploited. And we'll, we'll be talking about it in a few months. It's frustrating because we know it's happening. And that's why we have webinars like this, Hunter. That's why when you ask, I always try to join because I know you reach a large audience. And I always try to tell people, right now, something is probably going on in your company that you ought not to be doing and I don't always think, it's not always the, the employees. And John is right, employees don't, don't think about that. But gosh, they probably shouldn't have to. You know, you, you'd hope that the infrastructure would be set up so that they can do their work and not have to do the security. So, so usually the changes are being made in a more centralized manner by the IT and security teams, They're usually being forced to do things. So that's, you ask what keeps me up, what am I thinking about? It's that. It's that uncomfortable feeling that some stuff's happening right now, and I, I sure wish we could stop it. You know, Ed, you do some great research uh, in addition to uh, uh, keynotes at various uh, industry summits and so forth, and at, certainly at HMG network, uh, the HMG uh, summits as well. Uh, and you also have a research arm. Uh, 
where you uh, track uh, top tech companies that are innovating on the cyber uh, front in terms of providing uh, services to protect the enterprise. What are you seeing out there that's really uh, surging forward in terms of hot trends uh, from the new tech vendors? Well, I'll give you an example. One of the things I do is I'm a research professor at NYU. So we've been running an index. It's an interesting one. It's a sentiment index. And we do it with uh, Dan Gear. And many of your folks listening might, uh, might be familiar with Dan. has been with InQtel and previously with MIT and, and some, some, some folks who uh, um, are interested in, in, in sentiment indices. And here's what we do. We, we send out <laughs> routinely every month a, a sentiment survey to a very large number of experts. And, and literally the data um, goes back about a decade. So we've been doing this monthly for a decade. And we ask them questions, gut feel questions about threat and cyber uh, on the premise that maybe there's some value there. I honestly, I'm still well, 10 years into it, not entirely sure we've come to a conclusion that your gut feel matters. Because what we've seen over the 10 years is this monotonically increasing, oh my God, things are getting worse kind of index. It's just always getting worse. It'd be like the New York Stock Exchange just being a slope upward for 10 years. And we've been scratching our heads saying, how come there's not better shape to this? It seems like sometimes it should go down or go up more, or go, but it's this very clear trending upwards with the more recent problems, like once we, we realized that our nation had been much too slow in responding to this problem, and we hit March, April, and you know now we've got over 101,000 people dead, um, we watched that sentiment go up for the first time since I can remember. It's just data. It's data that you can measure. So it's gone up, and we think, wow, that's, that's interesting. That means a bunch of experts from a collage of different backgrounds, just people who have access to data, um, that collage of backgrounds is suggesting that maybe for the first time in a very long time, they're concerned that cyber is becoming a bigger, a bigger fear. Their gut tells them that there are probably some vulnerabilities that nation states, you heard John earlier reference some nation states, they probably are doing exactly what he said, probably coming so, at our infrastructure. So, so that's real data, and it's, it's a little frightening. Fascinating stuff. I'd love to get that out to the HMG network. Uh, we'll talk yeah. more about that as a follow-on one-on-one. Uh, when you think about boards and CEOs, uh, and the CEO's mandate, uh, at least my observation, is keep us out of the Wall Street Journal, yeah. which means keep us safe and secure, right? <laughs> and so it's a bo- your coach CISOs all the time. Yeah. How does that dialogue go, preparing a CISO for the boardroom? It's a big question. We might start it here and, and follow up on the panel here in a minute. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, first off, I think you know, and everyone listening knows, every board is different. So it's hard to provide sort of this monolithic guidance that here's what you do to prepare for a board session. Because, you know, the board of a high-tech company out on the left coast is going to be very different from the board of a bank, you know, in New York City. And, I, and I've been involved with both and, and sat on the board of a bank in New York City. I know how that works. So they're different, completely different. So the first sort of backdrop is there is no sort of monolithic answer to that. But in general, I think one of the things that we've been coaching uh, CISOs to, 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 try to try to do in their, in their interactions with boards is to recognize that boards are intelligent people. And maybe some of the coaching they've gotten at least the CISOs have gotten in the past that you have to kind of talk down or talk in simple business terms to explain things to board. I've been coaching just the opposite. I think that you, you, can, you can raise the game of a board by talking in terms that are, are reasonable to you and maybe raise the bar a little bit. And I found that that's been useful guidance. My experience with board members is that they are, they're capable. You don't get to that point you know, by being some dummy. Um, they're usually willing to put some time in to learn. You know, admittedly, some of them may not have a deep technical background, but look, take me, for example. I joined a bank. They didn't slow down for me. I had to go get a big fat book to read about how the Federal Reserve works and read about banking, and I loved it. And I, and I think that that kind of thing with boards is a, I'm not going crazy. You shouldn't put up, you know, SIM output for a board. That's ridiculous. But I do think a little bit of having them recognize that what we do, like what Boyden does at CISA, is a lot more than just 
you know, training people not to click on fishes. This is a tough discipline and board members should understand that there's some depth to what we do. There's depth to investigation. There's depth to pulling telemetry. There's depth to a security architecture. It's a hard thing to do and they should recognize it. So, and, and not be led into this false belief that, gosh, if everybody just wouldn't click on fishes, we'd be all fine. That, that is about as far from the truth as possible. And yet, some boards are led to believe that because they get a lot of baby talk. So that's been the, the coaching that I've been giving uh, CISOs. Wow, that's really fascinating. We should follow up on that. I think that's an article that I love it. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So we're going to segue over to the panel. Uh, and Ed, you'll be over there at the panel. Let's, uh, thanks for, again, thanks for coming on this, the program. Kristen, uh, welcome to the program. Kristen Lovejoy. Kristen uh, has an interesting point of view uh, in her role at ENY. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Tell us a little bit more about the context of your role and uh, what's, what's your, what you're interested in and the context of uh, a little bit your, about your background. Yeah, so uh, just you know, from a, a background perspective, I've been a security practitioner and started as a pen tester in uh, one of the national security agencies over 25 years ago now and have been on all sides of this industry. Um, have built and sold a couple of software companies, have, uh, I was the global CISO for IBM for some time. Um, currently, I am the uh, global cybersecurity leader for EY. And um, you know, my focus right now uh, at EY is really on sort of the juncture between business and cybersecurity and helping sort of build the bridge between um, the business functions and the security teams. You know, we've been, it was interesting, Ed was just talking about, you know, sort of what's going on. Like, why isn't it that we, why aren't we improving? And, you know, I've, you know, I've had this suspicion for, you know, some time that a lot of it has to do with just the health of the relationship between the security teams and the business lines or the relative not health of that relationship. And, you know, as we've, you know, as I joined EY, you know, one of the things that we've been doing is really doubling down on exploring the issue and understanding, you know, why is it that security teams are brought into a new uh, technology enabled business initiative or why not? What's the impact? And what we're finding is that only about 36% of new technology initiatives will actually include cybersecurity teams from the beginning. And, you know, when you ask the question of the business lines, like, why is that? It's typical reasons. They see the security team as being a roadblock. They see them as, you know, increasing cost, et cetera. And so I think that, you know, one of the reasons why we're, we're having a tough time is because of that cognitive dissonance. I also think that, you know, when it comes to, and Ed was also talking about sort of the board conversation, couldn't agree with him more. You know, but I think on the flip side, one of the areas where security teams have to improve is in their understanding and their ability to sort of uh, iterate the importance of risk mitigation within a business context. Because the business guys, the boards are asking, what am I getting for the investment I'm making? What's the risk? And if a CISO dives into the weeds and starts talking about micro-segmentation, they, they have no idea, like, is this good? Is this bad? Should we be making this investment? And so what they're looking for is an understanding of what's the return on value. And so, you know, in EY, you know, a lot of our focus recently has been on, you know, not just exploring the issue, but, you know, helping to align the business functions and the security teams enabling sort of a transformation of the security program so it can be plumbed more into the business functions, reorganizing the teams, implementing strategies, technologies, et cetera, that help make that real. Um, but that's really been the, the big focus that I've had at EY. Wow, that's uh, uh, a great presentation there, Kristen. Thank you. Go back to the cognitive dissonance. I thought that was kind of interesting. Can we poke down in there, click down there yeah. a little more, get a little more detailed what exactly uh, you're thinking, what you mean? Yeah, so this is really interesting. I mean, one of the things we looked at is just for, uh, from a perception perspective, like how do CISOs perceive their, um, their value in the business? And we asked them specific questions about the board. Like, do you see that the board is involved? Yes, 60 to 70% of them would say that the board is involved. Then you asked, so do you think that they value you? And 
most CISOs said that they saw the board, it was like 60% of CISOs said that the board valued them. Now, interestingly, organizations where CISOs felt that the board didn't care about cyber are the area or the organizations where they felt the most valued. So it's very interesting, sort of telling sim signal there. But they would say that the board values what they're doing. Now, I, we asked the same question to the board. 20% of the board members we asked said that they valued the, the contributions of the CISO. And most often the, bit, the boards were saying, we have no idea what they're talking about, right? So we just don't get their language. Now, when you ask the CISO, are you able to quantify and communicate security within business terms? 20% of them said yes. So there's almost a direct correlation between those CISOs that have the capacity to quantify risk in financial terms and the understanding and the appreciation of the board of the CISO function. So it's a very interesting dynamic. Now, poking down even more, one of the things we ask, you know, the CISOs are, what's the health of the relationship you have with other business functions, like the CMO, for instance? 79% of CISOs said that they actively had a negative to at best neutral relationship with the CMO. And it went down from there. It was like 60% said it was pretty bad with the lines of business. Their best relationships were with the IT and audit, which is understandable. But I think that, you know, when you think about just sort of the psychology of what's necessary for the security teams to be um, effective, it's this. And I think in COVID, um, this is all the more highlighted because I'm not going to cover, you know, sort of the, um, the stats that others have covered, but suffice to say, you know, based on our research, you know, 60% of organizations have adopted work from home technologies to enable this sort of new reality. And 60% of organizations are collecting data about employee health so that they can keep track of the employees, they understand the you know, sort of diagnosis, how to help them, et cetera. Meanwhile, only 20% of organizations have done PIA assessments on the data that they're collecting, and only 30% of organizations have done any kind of security control assessment of the new work from home technologies that they're implementing. So again, very consistent, but now you think about that from a COVID perspective and you say, okay, one of the biggest issues we have as an industry is this misalignment. Security is not being brought in from the, the beginning. So we're building cars without seatbelts and without brakes. They're on the road, they're running. Now in COVID, we've just supercharged that. Now going back to some of the points the other panelists have made, what does that mean 60, 120, two, three years from now? I think what we're going to be finding is we're going to pay the price for our lack of sort of focus on this issue from the beginning. Kristen, wow, um, great, great presentation. Thank you. Um, stay with us, stay with the panel. Next up, Jay Gonzalez. Jay's the CISO for Samsung Semiconductor. Jay, welcome to the program. Thanks, Hunter. Great to see you. Thanks for being engaged. A uh, little context of your role at Samsung and, uh, and what you oversee. Uh, I'm assuming it's uh, at least North America, maybe global. Right. It's, it, yes. So it's, uh, I'm the CISO for the device solutions arm of Samsung Electronics Corporation. So we do all the R&D for every internal device component that goes into every consumer electronic device that Samsung produces. So 90% of our work is R&D, uh, 90%. You know, it's just engineers doing what they need to do heads down. So they're like, usually not the people we have to worry about. It's the other 10% that are doing all the other roles. Um, those who are more, more social, more interactive with others, more willing to open emails, they probably shouldn't. But uh, a lot of the, what we do day in and day out is just monitoring our environment for intellectual property protection, you know, ensuring that data doesn't leave our environment, um, doesn't go to a competitor or something like that. So, Well, it's fiercely competitive, the industry you're in, right? Yes. Yeah. So. And so the intellectual property is the edge, and, and that's the probably a huge investment by the corporation over decades. Yes, it is. Yep. Yes. And so is it North American or global uh, mandate? It, it's a, well, it's a North America, so it's just mostly all of the R&D. So we have just uh, California and Texas and all of our remote sales offices. So 
uh, it's, it's interesting to say the least. So. What, what, what's new for you uh, post COVID-19? Um, well, more for us, it's a continuation of what the problem we already had. Um, most of our employees, um, you know, as uh, John was saying earlier, you know, they're not going home thinking about what they shouldn't or sh should or shouldn't be doing when it comes to security. Now they're at home and now they're even more frustrated because there's policies that haven't been adjusted in time. There's things they still can't access. So, you know, for them, they're looking at security as though we're still not supporting them the best that we can. Uh, we did have some issues, you know, um, Ed talked about, you know, having to deal with remote access gateway like people just were not able to get in not be able to connect not being able to do the things they thought they'd be able to at home um, and then we still have people doing some of the things they shouldn't be doing you know when they're sitting at home vice being in the office so for us it's really getting them to understand you know, they're not behind the firewalls behind the protections of the corporate environment now they're at home kind of like you're on your own in your own fight you know from your house or your living room wherever you're sitting today do you think there's a, a net increase uh, of attacks and risks now, given this work from home environment? Oh, absolutely. Um, most, you know, like I said, uh, most employees couldn't connect to VPN or something. So now they're staying offline, you know, working on their, their corporate systems. And because you're working at home, you have to do things for your family. You know, you have the balance at home now to just shift to do something you need to do for yourself or your family. And you're using your corporate system. You're accessing your, more of your, your personal email on a corporate device, you know, we don't have an email gateway to protect you when you're using personal email. That's just a gap that we always have. So for us, it's about what are they doing on their corporate system now that they're sitting behind that, you know, 90% of the time, as opposed to those who traditionally left their work PC in the office and just went home kind of disconnected. Right. Yeah. So when you think about this new work from home environment, uh, how can you help employees be more effective uh, in uh, protecting themselves and the company? So that's what we're doing. Actually, we're putting out uh, an increased uh, newsletters to let them know some of the challenges that we're seeing, you know, on their end. So, we, you know, they know that we're, we're, under, we're understanding we're on their side. We're trying to help them. Uh, a lot of what we're trying to do is kind of tailor our information security awareness training to, you know, them being remote, them not being in the office, because if you're not coming across a security officer or not, you know, getting some type of um, uh, error message in your in your browser saying you can't get to a site on a regular basis and the idea of security is kind of at the back of your mind if it's even on your mind um, so for us it's trying to get them engaged trying to get their training to be a little bit more interactive as opposed to trying to fast forward through a video because that's what we find is that our employees are very good about completing 15 minute videos in less than two minutes um, they've yet to show me how to do that I mean I spend the whole 15 minutes trying to do mine but you know typically they don't want to have to do all the training we give them and they find the shortest path to completion so any lessons learned jason on communicating effectively across the enterprise to employees or and or communicating up the value chain to the line of business and the c-suite and the board yeah i think we probably took some uh some things for granted as far as being effective in our communications to our employees um when they went home it was like they were completely disconnected and some of the problems that they had had they weren't communicating to us directly they might have gone to it but they didn't make their way to us and while we have a great relationship with our it team it's just some things they try to handle on their own they don't want to have us get involved because typically their easiest solution is not the preferred solution which usually results in more work for them um, and then the same thing uh communicating up you know reporting into the cfo his questions are very pointed um can we fix this as opposed to what are some of the strategies we could adopt and try to move forward with now that we have the opportunity uh so i think there's a disconnect on both sides whether communicating across the business or up through executive management there's just different expectations that they have and they want things to happen now not two months from now not three months from now they want things to go into effect and some of those things just aren't possible because they either don't have the personnel or we don't have the budget so so what have you been able to do, uh, Jason, in this environment uh, that you wouldn't normally have been able to get done uh, in a regular business as usual you know, post COVID-19? I think a lot of it's doing some of the managed services. Uh, some, there was just no budget there before. Now that everyone's working remote, uh, we don't have the visibility into what they're doing at home. So it's more about some of the managed detection and response capabilities that exist today, how we can leverage those. Um, uh, thankfully, some of the prices are very accommodating due to the crisis, so that makes it a little easier to get some funding we didn't have before. But, you know, being that no one's in the office, it's, okay, so what are we monitoring now? Because there's nobody here. Uh, we need to focus, you know, on the cloud and what they're doing remotely so we know exactly what they're doing. A lot of our on-premise on solutions don't touch them at home because we don't have, you know, another server sitting in the DMZ to have them connect to when they're sitting at home. So now it's 
now they're doing whatever they want to do and I have no idea what they're doing. And that's very concerning to me and my team is, you know, now we're going to have to go clean up after the fact once they come into the office and we're able to identify some of those things. I mean, fortunately, some of the endpoint protection solutions we have in place today, you know, those types of things have a persistent cloud connection. So you don't have to worry about what's actually happening. It's everything else they're doing that we may not be catching. So. Do you think incident response becomes more difficult to, uh, to manage? Yes. Um, a lot of it, again, goes back to the training is that the employees don't know what to look for, what to recognize and who to contact. So having that disconnect already is going to significantly delay the instant response effort that we have because they're going to be fumbling around trying to figure out who do I go to, who do I call, you know, because our IT team is very minimal as well. Trying to get a hold of somebody is even more difficult. So for them, having the right contact, the right email, who to contact by phone or emails or distro list, something like that, they don't have that readily available to them. Uh, that's one of the things we did push out after they went home was that, you know, don't forget to save this information into your mobile device in case your laptop gets stolen or something, right? You go try to run a quick errand and you have your laptop with you. That's still a problem we deal with today, even with them being at home, is that you're not supposed to be out to begin with, but you were and you elected to take your corporate PC with you. So, Jason, thanks for sharing. Great insights. Stay with us. We'll be back to you in a minute. Uh, John, you want to come back on the program? John, you there? Great, good to see you again. Hey, John, what's the upside of the COVID uh, uh, crisis and uh, the, the current pandemic? What's the upside for the business? So some of the upside is that the technological advances that we're seeing uh, is on steroids. You know, I hear a lot of negativity about AI from uh, non-cyber folks. Look at all the jobs it's gonna be taking away. It's expected that over a period of time, we're going to lose about 1.8 million jobs because of the implementation of AI. But the number nobody ever talks about, it's also expected we're going to create 2.3 million jobs because of AI. So we need to transition workers to more technological jobs. And as we have younger workers coming out of school who have technology backgrounds, we now have the immediate need for these types of positions, even more so than we've had before. And it's going to create many new jobs to put people to work. Excellent, John. And, you know, we're a big fan of leadership, leadership leading to win, leading courageously, leading passionately. What do you think leaders need to do best to serve their companies in this time of crisis? So job number one, figure out what the customer wants. As people are becoming aware of, hey, I don't have to get in my car and drive to my doctor's office anymore for just a random prescription fill or things like that, all businesses need to look at how are they serving their customers now versus how do their customers want to be served in the future and transition the workforce to address that. Not only leading by example, but motivating people to understand yeah, there's a learning curve for many in this, just like uh, Jay was speaking before about employees not thinking about security. But that learning curve will pay back so significantly in lower overheads, increased profits, meeting the needs during this pandemic and beyond. When you think about what businesses need to do now more than ever to remain competitive, some uh, lessons learned or tips? Let's take a look at who is being successful. There are a lot of companies doing remote work and providing services remotely before the pandemic hit, and they have just kept doing what they do best. Don't reinvent the wheel. These are easy models out there to look at and decide how are we gonna transition in businesses. I deal with a lot of companies today that are using six or seven different technologies to function the same thing, whether they're on a Zoom call or a webinar or go, go to webinar meetings, et cetera. Streamline, decide what platforms you wanna use and then implement the security measures for those platforms. Half of my business these days are companies that are being Zoom bombed and they can't get business done because they're doing so many different things with so many different technologies not taking the time to train their employees properly and then suffering the consequences. Get on the same sheet of music, make sure everybody's playing it well. 
John, how about collaboration uh, and collaborating effectively with the CIO and the, and the C-suite in the line of business? And how about a different mindset about leadership, leadership being servant leadership, leading, leading humbly, leading uh, passionately, leading courageously, and building those, those relationships? I think Kristen highlighted so well in the EMY report that those relationships are, 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 are difficult. In the midst of COVID, CIO and CISO is king. Uh, the reality is these folks have never been needed more than they are today. And the C-suites that weren't quick to recognize that before suddenly are at their mercy in many respects. Now is the time to embrace these folks and make sure that everybody has an equal voice at the table because it's all about messaging from the top. The CISO has always been there, standing by, ready to help the company move forward. It's incumbent upon leadership to learn the language. I heard some comments before about, you know, we don't know what the CISO is really saying. We don't understand. It's no different than the generational gap. As a leader in the FBI, I had employees 30 years younger than me. I needed to understand their communication level. They needed to learn mine a little bit as well. The same thing with CISO and other leadership within corporation. CISOs need to speak their language and make sure the employees understand the language and vice versa. This is the opportunity to all work together. That's brilliant, Sean. Uh, really well stated. Stay with us here. Hey, Ed, welcome back to the uh, program. Sure. Uh, same idea, Ed. When you think about the gap between CISOs and CIOs, CISOs the line of business, CISOs in the C-suite, mm. how do you coach CISOs to be more effective, leading courageously, leading passionately, and it's the best time ever right now to be a tech leader. Well, it's not easy because most chief information security officers are viewed by their uh, CEO as being unfit for any other job in the business. You know, they're usually viewed as being a hired gun, maybe coming up through the ranks, but having a capability that's specific, meaning you know, there's the CISO, he or she um, deals with hackers, but they would never dream in a million years of perhaps moving the CISO to a marketing position. Name for me one CISO on planet Earth in the last five years who's moved from the CISO position to a position in the same organization that was non-technical. And, and I don't think you can find one. There's a couple of move to chief risk or move to you know, somewhat larger roles in infrastructure. Those are adjacent moves. But Show me one that, that, that shifts. So that's, that causes a problem. That, that means that you suddenly are part of an executive team that sees you as a one-off. And I know the feeling. I was uh, part of a Fortune 10 company, you know, one of 100 or so people running a Fortune 10 company, and was still viewed as the cyber guy. You know? And, and that, that's part of the coaching that I believe that to be an effective chief information security officer, you learn to, need to learn to be an executive. And what that means is understanding the business that you're in and understanding that maybe you're playing a role, but that that role fits into a larger mosaic of different concerns that drive the business forward. The goal is not to be the most secure company. The goal is to be a successful company, one that, that balances the needs of your customers and grows revenue in a responsible way. And also, you know, for the, from a security perspective, does what needs to be done. But again, always balancing the, the mission, the overall mission of what needs to be done. Sometimes risks have to be taken. Um, so I think that's been the most difficult thing in, in dealing with CISOs and currently, just trying to convince them that being an executive is, is different than being effective in say, snapping together a security architecture or negotiating good security vendor contracts. Those are different, They're different different experiences and different skills. That might be a white space that we consider working on together, uh, some kind of a CISO Leadership Institute uh, digitally and virtually. Um, yeah, I, I saw it happen in personnel. I went back and looked, there's a great book by Alfred Sloan where he describes his years at General Motors. It's kind of a boring book, frankly, but it's a good one because he talks about building General Motors in those early years, of 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And what's cool about the book is he has org charts for each decade at General Motors. So I went back, I have an early edition. My wife bought me an early edition book, a copy of the book. 
And you go in and you look and you see that there was no human resources function, even personnel function in the 1920s or 30s. But then in the 40s, with World War II, we all realized, wow, personnel is important. You know, putting people in the right jobs. We learned that in World War II. And after World War II, General Motors has a, had an executive running personnel. And then in the 50s, it moved up. And in the 60s, it moved up higher. And today, show me one company in the Fortune 1000 that doesn't have an HR executive reporting directly to the CEO. So we watched the evolution of that position from being non-existent and it bubbled up to now it's a direct report. I believe that it makes perfect sense. I suspect the other panelists would agree that at some, time, some point soon, you need some executive that deals with risk uh, in every company. I know like carriers, telecommunication carriers don't have a chief risk officer. It's not a position that exists. But you probably need somebody who deals with information, preparedness, cyber, just sort of having that general uh, sense of risk and should be reporting directly to the chief executive officer. Banks do it, but just about everybody else doesn't. I think that will happen. And I think that'll be an executive not a cyber nerd like all of us. It, won't, it wouldn't be me. It would be somebody who has a broader perspective. Interesting. So uh, it won't be a CISO, though. It'll be a right. senior executive that understands cyber. And I think that's right. I think that's, that, that seems like a position that if I was a CEO of a large company, I'd, I'd want someone like that working for me. So where does a CISO now tend to report, Ed? What's the matrix? What's the, what's the org chart? What are the percentages? Uh, they're all, all over like? the map, right? Different industries, different countries, different sized uh, entities. Or, or it's all over the map. You know, um, one, one thing I always did was I had, I had a little bit of seniority, so I kind of moved my position where I thought it went. I tried to move to people who I thought had a lot of capital budget <laughs> control. So you, you move to people who can go help you get your budget. So that, that seemed very tactical, but um, you know, you get the whole, should you report to the CIO or, or be a peer to the CIO? It all depends. You know, it, this, it all depends. Every company is different. I, I don't think there's a good formula right now for where the CISO should report. Um, but I can tell you that at some point, there really does need to be someone senior enough and with a broad enough executive skills to, to really, like Kristen was saying earlier, having somebody you can communicate with the board is really important. What happens now, I bet Kristen will agree, is that the relationship between the CISO and the board is so heavily curated that, you know, and, I, and I've been on the, the presenting side, I've been on the side being presented to, and I've been a consultant doing the, the guidance. All of it, you, you, you go in with 16 charts that tell a story, and then your boss whittles it down to eight, and then the board secretary whittles it down to four, and then you're the, the last thing before lunch, so before you minute, know it, it's five minutes, and the board just says, hey, hey Ed, are we okay? And, and now it's just a one-word answer. Your 16 charts, is down, and you go, yeah, we're okay. And they go, oh, great, everybody laughs, and go to lunch. I mean, that's, so that kind of curation needs an executive to say, time out. We're not going to set this aside. This is an important part of our agenda. This is not the place. It's not the slush place where you get time. When other things go over, we just contract the cyber thing. You need a powerful executive to say, no, this is something we make time for. And yes, Kristen's right. You got to do it business terms. I get all that. But, yep. but by the same token, they should understand things like, for example, that cloud is not the enemy anymore. Like I bet if you ask a bunch of um, board members and you say, hey, what do you think about cloud? They go, oh my gosh, we're worried about moving our nice safe stuff in here to that big bad cloud out there. And they would be right if we were doing a great job protecting credentials now, but right, like John and others have known for years, we suck at protecting stuff. So maybe putting things at letting Microsoft help us is probably a pretty good idea. Explaining that to a board member is a challenge, and that requires a, an executive who knows how to explain that in terms that would make sense. So makes sense. That, that, that's what we need. We need people who can do that job, and they don't exist now. Right? Brilliant. Well stated. Ed, thanks so much for taking the time out and coming on the program today. Uh, Kristen, final word. Uh, you referenced a report uh, earlier on, uh, some new findings uh, regarding the size and scale of a uh, uh, breaches and such. Uh, any other kind of tidbits that you want to enlighten us with? No, 
you know, I think that um, it, it, it's pretty clear and everybody said that, you know, we're seeing an increase in, you know, things like ransomware attacks, et cetera. So about you know, 50, 60% of organizations worldwide would say they're seeing an increase. What I think is interesting though, that we're not talking about very much and for legitimate reason is the number of ransomware payments that are actually happening. Um, so this is something we're, you know, we're focusing on now or being asked to consult with a lot of cor corporations on this area. And I think because it is not necessarily being interpreted as a disclosable event, we're not hearing quite as much about the number of ransomware payments that are actually going out. So I think that this is going to be kind of, maybe it's more of an academic subject, but I think over the months to come, the interpretation of, you know, does a ransomware event need to be um, disclosed if there's been no exfiltration? is kind of an important issue. Now they're mostly they're exfilling the data too, <laughs> just so that there's a backup plan if you don't pay. But that's another story. Um, I think that uh, that is going to become sort of a hot topic, you know, once some of these things come to light. Excellent. Thank you so much. Appreciate your coming on the program. Really, uh, really excited to have you engage with HMG. Thank Thanks, you. Kristen. And uh, Jay, you want to come on, come back and just say a final parting comments? Sure. I mean, my, my last thing would be kind of what I was hitting on over and over again was maintaining communication with your employees uh, while they're at home. Because I think right now, even trying to get messages out across the business, everything that's COVID related gets, you know, kind of prioritized over everything else we want to tell them about security and best practices while at home. So any way you can stay in contact with your employees, you know, don't miss that opportunity to do so. Excellent. Thanks so much. Great to meet you, Jay. Great job. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Next up, folks, is our executive search panel. We uh, often uh, will always have a search panel, always have that thread in terms of helping you and your career. Uh, it's always good to be positioned with the search execs. Uh, first up, Aileen Alexander. Aileen from Corn Ferry. Uh, Aileen, you have a new role at Corn Ferry. Welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, Hunter. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. And I guess we're, this is uh, Philadelphia, right? That's right. Now, yeah, after 13 years in Washington, um, I did make a move. I'm still, I'm still in Washington when not, you know, trapped here by COVID. Um, but after 13 years there, uh, moved up to the Philadelphia area and, and also run our, our Philly office for Corn Ferry. Yeah, and Aileen's got an amazing background, an amazing uh, uh, history uh, in, uh, in D.C. and military as well as uh, search. So what do you see now with your CISO searches right now? And What's what's got your eye? No, it's it's interesting. And just listening to the panelists prior, lot, lots of consistent themes that that we're observing. I think first and foremost, I'm not sure who who said it, but if you're in the CIO or CISO seat, you know it's it's pretty active in in terms of the marketplace right now. Technology, cyber, privacy are are front and center. I think organizations that didn't have a CISO or hadn't level set that CISO in, in the right way, talk about having a seat and also a voice at the table. Um, we're definitely see, seeing some movement uh, in, in the market. In, in some cases, we're seeing, particularly in critical infrastructure, uh, the, the need to have the, if not elevated or positioned in the right way, um, you know, changing that right in, in real time so that the, the broader C-suite, of course, the boards are, are very engaged uh, right now as well. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting and it's an active, it's an active market uh, in these last uh, two, two, two and a half months or so. Fascinating stuff. Um, when you think about top traits or characteristics that you look for in your next big CISO search, Where's the gap? Where's the delta? We were talking a little bit with uh, Ed and uh, Kristen about the gap of the CISOs performing effectively in the business, uh, in the C-suite, in the boardroom. What do you look for in your next kind of placement? Uh, what, what are the professional leadership skills, executive skills, and soft skills? Yeah, no, I think I think Ed and Kristen framed it up in, in absolutely the right way. I mean, there's definitely an increased emphasis on, on the business savviness, really understanding uh, the business priority strategy first. Uh, when we're now interviewing uh, candidates, you know, often now the, what differentiates the good from the great are those that, you know, the publicly traded company have gone in and have run, you know, have read earnings transcripts, right? And, and have a good pulse of, of where that industry or that, or that company is going. Um, it, is, it is all on those softer attributes, you know, after the business, 
capability. It's around those, those communication skills, operating, influencing, connecting uh, across the enterprise, um, being effective in, in the boardroom, translating um, to business and risk uh, needs. Um, we're uh, hearing a lot around relationship building and, and what I call being able to operate at the scenes. So connect the dots as you're innovating and enabling from a technology perspective and, and managing risk and, and ensuring privacy. Uh, being being effective effective there. Um, what's interesting outside of bringing CISOs in to do to do the function in front of them is around um, which I think is inherent in a, in a lot of CISOs is being a change agent, right? We're in a time of disruption and and change. So um, I think some are looking at bringing that extra leadership muscle, you know, into the enterprise on on that front. Interesting, brilliant. Thanks so much, Eileen. Stay with us. We'll be. I'll circle back to you. Next up, Michael Piacente. Michael's a great friend and a partner out of the West Coast, co-founder and managing partner of Hitch Partners. Michael, good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, hey, look, we had a great prep call this week. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your practice, your space, and the, the recent report and the findings that you've, uh, you've come across. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I actually grew, outside, I grew up uh, just outside of Annapolis, so it's good to be part of this particular event. Uh, good to have the uh, DC folks on. Uh, yeah, Hitch Partners is a, we're an executive search firm as well in the, um, we specialize purely in the CISO and head of security uh, area and our particular niche is in the engineering oriented sort of AppSec or uh, what we call sec engine environments. Uh, most of our clients are uh, kind of high consequence software producing companies that already deliver their services uh, using uh, multiple public clouds. And so they're rapidly moving in that direction. Uh, so it's been really, this has been a really interesting time during COVID because uh, we've seen uh, a, a lot of the echoes, what Aileen just said and, uh, as well, but um, it, this kind of stress on uh, strong, you know, taking more technical resources and having them more focused on the executive and board level communication, um, you know, not just business risk, but also cor corporate preparedness and sustainability planning. Many, many of our CISOs are leading this effort, whereas before they were a key player, but not leading it. That's one area. Uh, another, another is a sort of emphasis on humanizing their management style. A lot of uh, CISOs right now are kind of the key hiring manager in many companies um, as security continues to be ro a robust hiring market. Um, and so finding it difficult to, to, to do that in a remote setting. Uh, and, then, and then the other thing uh, just for us, uh, we're seeing is, a, is an enormous emphasis on security engineering talent at the leadership level uh, moving uh, kind of to a hybrid model of uh, enterprises needing to, from enterprises to small venture funded companies, really focusing on that engineering leadership area. Um, so th those are some, some areas that we see. I, I think on the, on the comp survey, yeah, that, that was, um, that's been a fun one the last few years. We just noticed that there wasn't a really uh, a true source of, of real data that CISO's um, we're, we're looking at as far as both their compensation, but also the reporting structure. I think Ed brought it up before, uh, and he's right. I mean, we had uh, starting off the year with nine CISO searches of which eight of them reported to a different <laughs> executive function in those companies, um, you know, eight different uh, C-levels. Uh, so it says a lot about their, you know, the CISO is uh, really struggling with a, with a natural home right now after having it historically under the CIO for many, many years. It's, it's, that, that's definitely shifting. And so the data just wasn't there. Um, it was primarily older data. It was based on other other functions. And so we just wanted to come up with a way that the the, you know, the, the, the community, it's not monetized, it's just a community tool that you can use. And you know, we're not survey guys. <laughs> we're, uh, we do the best we can on the marketing side, but uh, we make it professional enough that everyone can participate and also uh, use it. I think we had over 400 participating uh, CISOs this past, uh, this past go around, so. Awesome. Look, look forward to learning more about that. You know, you. question for you. Uh, we're big into leadership, big into leading courageously and passionately and authentically in this crisis and this trying time. What is what is leading and winning look like uh, now? And I realize in the context, right, so many of your clients are tech companies or tech centric kind of companies from the Valley. I know you have a North American presence, but that's kind of your point of view, right, Michael? Right. Yeah, I, I would say the, the, the biggest area that, I, not to repeat, uh, Aileen brought up was, was excellent um, and, and the others, but I think the one thing that we, 
we see right now uh, from, from the CISO leaders uh, a real need and actually been amazed with the examples, but uh, just empathy. Um, you know, being an empathetic leader, um, being an empathetic communicator, uh, people are stressed. And every, if you look at these companies, you, know, you have multiple generations in all these companies now. Uh, they have very different perspectives of what security means, how, it, how they approach it, both from a personal level and also a corporate level. And it's just, uh, it can be really stressful. So just understanding what everyone, that everyone that's going through this and has gone through it, and even as we come out in post uh, pandemic world, it's not gonna look the same. And I think just uh, being, being the CISO that is built for a crisis and can put all those years of experience of, of preparing for this and then learn how to be more humanized or empathetic to all the situations going around, especially around their teams who are highly stressed. And you know, if they weren't overworked before, they certainly are now. Um, it's really hard to separate uh, from work from home. And, you know, I walk out of here and I've got kids asking me for math questions and which I'm horrible at, but, um, but those are, you know, those are just real things that, uh, that the CISO's world has to go through. So I, I think empathy is the thing that I've always hit upon. Um, and it's something that they could really improve their brand uh, overall as a community too. And then back to what Ed and uh, John and all, and uh, Kirsten were talking about was being boardroom and line of business ready, right? What does it take to have executive presence skills and take every opportunity to practice that uh, exercise, that muscle to be effective in the, in, in the C-suite, in the boardroom? Yeah, I, I love what Ed said. We, we practice the same. And, you know, uh, they, they're adults. Uh, they're smart. They're there for a reason. Um, you know, don't uh, try to uh, uh, bring the, the level of complexity down in the discussion. Uh, you certainly don't want to go through logs with them. But but also make sure that you're heard and that they really understand the true business risk uh, down to the level of explaining the technologies. I think, um, I think we come out of COVID. One thing that's for sure when we come out of COVID is a lot more people will be a lot more aware of security um, requirements and just technology in general. We've all had to become our own mini IT departments in some way, shape, or form. So I think this is uh, really a, a golden era for the CISO to be able to, to capture that. Excellent, Michael. Thank you so much. Stay with us. Thank we'll you. circle back around to you. Next up, Stephen uh, Spagnola. Stephen's uh, the Digital Security and Risk Practice Lead at Stanton Chase. Steve, great to see you. Hey, Hunter, how are you? Hey, Aileen. Hey, Michael. Good to see you guys. Hey, Steve. We usually uh, shake hands on stage, so this, you know, I want to make sure we're all together on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> very good. Love it. Uh, so, Steve, what's, what's new in your world since uh, in the past 10 weeks, and, and what are you seeing now, and what's the future look like to you? Well, uh, and I've said this on uh, past panels, Hunter, but I'll repeat myself purposely. Uh, it's a couple parallel thematics. You know, we've heard this and said earlier in, in a, a different way, but the CISO really is the beacon of light across the organization in this, this time of uh, what I call uh, uh, continuous ambiguity, adversity, and fluid zero benchmark operating environment. And, and what I mean by that um, is, you know, if there's any one person in the organization and his or her team that is used to operating in a, in a daily fog of war environment, it's the CISO. I mean, it's part of their remit. It's a lot of unknowns out there. You know, try to minimize the reactive and anticipate, uh, but it largely is kind of reacting and it's kind of, you know, mitigating risk. Um, uh, and, and so that comfort level, um, has really blossomed across the organization. And it's, it's you know, Don, you know, mentioned it, it's, it's really a, a, a moment in time for the CISO and the, the CIO in that regard um, as, as an organizational leader. The other uh, thematic is um, not to uh, tout my own blog, but I wrote a piece uh, just prior to the pandemic on unity of effort wins the day in cyber. And you know, I can also say now, you need effort with today in COVID, you know, more generally. What does that mean? Uh, it kind of speaks to kind of the essentials we're talking about. It's, um, you know, I use, I've been using for years now the, the, uh, the case study of, uh, of uh, skunk, skunk Works. You know, Lockheed Martin, when they built, you know, in the 50s, the you know, U-2, and then later on the SR-71. And it's really kind of mission-oriented, put all the agendas aside, you have, you have uh, support from public and private, but they're going to stay out of the way and, you know, turn, turn it around. And so, and, in, and it's, it's a military term, but it's also um, kind of a universal language. It's, again, put the egos aside, let's bring, in the military sense, you're working with the sister services towards a, a strategic objective or operational objective, but 
here and now across the organization. Yes, everything we've heard about when it comes to theme is communication. This whole hour and a half is the lack of communication, the need to communicate. And on the one hand, yes, it's there, and let's kind of break those boundaries down. But on the other hand, I mean, as, as an operator, I'm first, first and foremost an operator, I mean, that's the sense it's operating. And I, I get kind of just quietly frustrated when I hear that. I know it's there, and it's, it's something we all, on, on our world that we deal with, but this is not rocket science. It's, you know, let's recognize we don't all know the answers. And that's, I think that's the biggest wall barrier is, you know, maybe this way we all know the answers, we build these walls around us. And let's kind of just go in kind of, we, we, you know, collectively, and we'll do this together. So there's that. And the other, the other uh, parallel theme is um, just, you know, defining what is your operating environment or what, excuse me, operating rhythm in this new environment? Because, you know, we, we, there is clearly an operating rhythm pre-pandemic or in pandemic, and there, there is and will be a new rhythm, operating rhythm, kind of how we kind of nuance it day to day organizationally in, you know, post-COVID. So that's what we're talking to our clients about. You know, uh, I love it. Um, you know, often it takes some kind of a competitive context, an enemy, a crisis, uh, a mission to really think bigger, to think with a sense of purpose, urgency, and mission towards success. And COVID 19's created an incredible opportunity for CEOs and C suite executives to get things done that would have taken decades or 10 years to get done, and it happened overnight. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, and Aileen's former military, uh, Chris has been around the military, uh, but your opening guest, Wooden, and I try not to kind of, you know, that was many moons ago, many fewer pounds ago, but um, there's a few things like pure competition or engagement, football field, we're not all playing football or combat, in this case, digital combat, that uh, forces folks to focus and align. And so, you know, nobody would wish COVID on anybody and we wish it didn't happen, but let's, let's learn from this and grow from it and make our, you know, you know, as John mentioned, kind of go multiple steps forward, not just kind of one team, two steps forward. So there, there, you know, we would think there are some good things coming out of this from an organizational digital transformation standpoint. You know, I think there's a, a silver lining here, right? So people that really leaned into this and are leading courageously and passionately this could be the best time ever to be really that courageous leader and really showing what you can deliver. Right, Steve? I think, I think you're onto something, Hunter. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm all jazzed up leadership. And again, sorry to the military seat, but you know, Naval Academy guy, former Marine guy, but so I kind of, you know, eat this stuff for lunch, but you know, we mentioned to Ed earlier about kind of an offshoot on the H and V side, this leadership kind of uh, academy for CISOs. I mean, it's something Ed and I talked about uh, several years back and, uh, I wish I was, I was listening. I was like, I wish, I wish CISOs and frankly some board members as well would be able to have just two weeks of just kind of um, operational leadership training. I mean, I know they have organizational leadership training a lot, but just something where it's just kind of very focused, the kind of you know, mission alignment on, on a, with a cyber overlay. I think we get a lot of ground there. I think so too. You know, on the chat here, uh, one of the attendees just said a nice compliment. Best post COVID-19 webinar summit on the topic of leadership for CISOs. So I'm really excited that you got, you made it here, Steve. Thanks so much. Well, it's a credit to you all. You guys have been out front, uh, it's not week day one or with day two, certainly week one with the, uh, you know, getting a first, first uh, mover on doing this. It's been great. Excellent. Thanks for your engagement, Steve. Back over to Aileen. Aileen, uh, welcome back to the program. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you, what are your takeaways, Aileen, out of this? What are you looking for in terms of that next CISO when you're going to place in that next amazing job? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it aligns to, to what you're hearing with from Michael and, and Stephen, right? It's, it's, you know, we're in a very disruptive moment. It's an opportunity to be um, creative, you know, not just lead courageously, but to innovate and think about how you, how you do things um, different. And 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 take take things forward. You know, I love the concept. I am biased here, Stephen. You know, with unity of effort. Um, so I think you know there's an opportunity there. Um, you know, for 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 a lot of a lot of thesis. I just keep coming back to the softer capabilities. Michael mentioned empathy. Yes, you know that's that's spot on. I think, you know, understanding the human element, um, bringing the best out of people to move move things forward. Um, 
listening, engaging, uh, you know, influencing, um, you know, driving resiliency in an enterprise to adapt during, you know, this digital acceleration. I mean, I think, Hunter, that's what you're referring to. We're just, we're on an acceleration uh, mode here. And, and a lot of CISOs have demonstrated that they have that nimbleness, right? It's a con they're, they're in constant change. And, and I think that CISOs that keep coming back beyond security, they're going to bring that muscle into into these companies and, and into these organizations. So it's, I don't know who said it, but it's a good moment um, for CISOs and we, and we should seize it and just continue to all evolve in, in how we lead. Excellent. Thanks, Aileen. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the program today, too. I think we have a poll wanted to pop up here uh, regarding the workplace uh, in Q4 2020. Where will, where will work be conducted as of Q4? Uh, highly distributed, very distributed, moderately, or more than half the employees will be working in dedicated offices again. If you take a minute to populate that, we'll see if we can get some, uh, some interesting insights. Thanks. Michael, once you come back to the program, uh, when you think about um, lessons learned, what are you hearing from your clients uh, the ones that really that you really respect and like, uh, what are you hearing from the? What are their what are their demonstrated leadership and performance skills that you're seeing from them that really stand that stand out? Yeah, I think um, uh, the CISOs that really stand out are uh, ones that can really hone in on their presence. They they have an established brand around communication. Uh, it's not off putting, but it's very collective. Um, they, they bring everyone into the fold. They can talk to multiple audiences and shift from one meeting to the next, one Zoom call to the next in these days. Um, and so that's, uh, I think their ability to be almost a chameleon uh, as a communicator uh, has really resonated with, uh, with that. And actually that, that goes back to the interviews as well. Um, you know, those, those, those candidates that are interviewing for roles that are able to be, um, re to really move from one and shift from one conversation to another with grace, uh, with clarity, uh, with cohesiveness in their message. Uh, are really shining. Uh, I think. I think the other the other area that um, which is really key right now. Um, that I, mean, I might be a little bit contrarian on this, but I think uh, the the CISOs that I know that are successful are very broad and deep across the scope of uh, the CISO world. Um, you know, their their entire scope, which is an enormous scope, and it's only been growing. I, I like to joke around and say that the CISO might be uh, close to becoming a cul de sac of uh, cul de sac of. Uh, of, of uh, technical debt, <laughs> getting a lot of things thrown under them right now that maybe they didn't wish upon themselves. Um, but nonetheless, I, I think um, having uh, CISOs having a real particular skill set, whether it's a security engineering focus or, or a GRC focus uh, or a, you know pure endpoint focus, but having an expertise among their spider web of of of, uh, of of general knowledge is going to be really key. They have to be an expert on one thing or another, and, and really for and, and brand it as well. Be able to write about that, be a thought leader on that. And I think the final thing is just being able to for these companies that really don't know their opening plans fully or the sustainability plans. Um, you know, it's not it's not written out. These are all new blueprints we're creating. There's a lot of collaboration going on. But I think a CISO that's able to force the rest of the organization and to lead by looking around the corner. And to understand what, what really is next, what, how are we going to open to make our employees safe and to make them feel comfortable? Um, how are we going to protect, protect ourselves from everything from insider threats to nation state of threat? It's a, a massive, massive scope. And I, so I think, I think their ability to communicate that and look around the corner, those are, the, those are really the three areas that we see time and time again. Excellent, Michael. Thanks so much for your insights and thought leadership. How can people get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, website, uh, hitchpartners.com. And uh, we have, we're pretty active on the, uh, the blog circuit, I guess, doing the best we can to get the messaging out there. So Excellent. Great to support. see you. Thanks for coming on the program today. Hey, Steve uh, Spags, we got 30 seconds. Final word? Uh, two important things and one final word. Hopefully all good users are doing this. In this age period of COVID, identifying these emerging, aka surprise leaders that maybe we didn't think of as leaders pre-pandemic, hugely important to recognize those folks and maybe assess the folks, some folks you thought were leaders, maybe didn't really uh, do so well um, or less, less so in this heightened uh, operating state. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's important. Cross training with deputies, naming deputies, having them uh, aligned is important because we all know we're the headhunters. Pieces are being pulled away. 
So do your organization do them a favor, kind of getting them ready to step into the breach. And I think, um, you know, just to, to round it out, again, this is not rocket, this is not hard stuff. This is not rocket science stuff. Whether you're new into the organization or if you're a veteran and haven't done it, spend time with the business unit leaders, get to know the business units, and really forge those relationships. I mean, it's still comes down to relationships. You have relationships across the organization. They will speak on your behalf, so you don't have to really market yourself so much that. This is kind of, you know, it takes some legwork. It takes effort. You get out of the office and do that, and it's busy, you're busy already. But these are the important things to do to be successful in your organization, I think. Stephen, brilliant insights and thought leadership. Thanks for being such a fan and supporter of the HMV platform and network and being here today. It's the summit. Eileen, great job. Michael, great job. Again, Steve, great job. I want to thank all thank of the panelists and speakers today for being here at HMG Live, uh, our DC CISO Summit. Uh, please stay tuned, stay connected, and uh, lead on with courage and passion authentically. Uh, again, thanks to everyone. Appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Bye now. Thank you.